Hi, I'm Joe Bustillos. I'm a professor at Full Sail University in their online education, media design, and technology master's program, working with educators wanting to move their instruction into this media-rich era. Previously, I was an educator in Southern California, working 13 years as a sixth grade teacher, school site technology coordinator, computer lab teacher, and middle school computer lab survivor. Hey, here's a picture of my blog. This is what I spend my time doing these days, uh, besides working at Full Sail. You'll find this presentation and the resources listed in this listed at this URL, http colon slash slash disruptive dash ed dash tech dot com. Anyone question that we are experiencing a mobile technology invasion? A bit of a reality check here. So four, four possible reactions. Denial, there's nothing going on here. Ban, we don't understand it. It's not part of our experience. It must be bad. Ban it. Okay, there's something going on here. Every man for himself, open the floodgates. Something's going on here. How can we use this to our advantage? We obviously want to be in that fourth group. We may not feel like we have many options, but I've learned that there are always options. We just want to avoid the ones that get us into more trouble than they're worth. So what do we do now? So having a good plan is essential. We know that something's happening. We want to take advantage of these possible changes. So what I've got here is five principles that we need to keep in mind as we plan for this change. Okay, no one likes being told what to do. The best, most important resource is the person that you're working with. People are not machines. I know sometimes that they can be a real pain, and I've been in programs where the coordinator more or less told the staff that we were going to have to change everything and that they needed to throw away how they used to do things and to do it the new way. Little wonder that after one year, one third of the staff left for other assignments. In the classroom, there is nothing more important than the years of experience that your colleagues have accomplished. Help them find and remember the gems that they can bring to the change that you are planning for. With students, there's even a greater potential if we can find the thing that used to motivate them, work with them to move them from the old to the new. Also, this means when working with those above you in the organization, you need to make your plan advantageous to their needs and not just the needs of your subordinates. While it should seem to be enough that you found a way to do a better job by doing this thing, you need to make it sound like you are making it easier for him or her above you to do their job as well. Okay, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, unless you are responsible for a whole school site or district or bigger. Where even the change, wherever the change is being expected to happen, leave room for meaningful variation. Education is one of the most human enterprises that we humans do, and we do not like being reduced to what works somewhere else. Let us own the process by letting us have meaningful application of our own understanding of what the intend, intended changes means. Okay. Education is notorious for putting all the focus on the face-to-face -face time with students as being the only real working time. It's all the more difficult when under this kind of pressure and then trying to make changes in how you do things. When I was working in one of the schools uh, that I was working at doing a three-year magnet school grant, we needed to go from an unnetworked school with 30 classrooms in one largely unused Macintosh to a completely networked school with five or seven Macintoshes in every classroom plus a new 30 station Mac lab and a brand new video journalism studio. I said that the experience was akin to working on the transmission of a car while driving over 70 miles an hour and also continually being late while we were at it. When planning for change, give yourself enough time to be able to have ongoing cycles to regain your energy so that you can make sure that you're successful. Okay, this is a tough one. But, anyone, but anything that can harness the energy of your students or colleagues and move them in the direction that serves the main purpose of the course or the class is a good thing. This does push against the concepts of control and mastery. All I can say is sometimes it's much more effective and easier to be a passionate coach than an iron-fisted dictator. Change needs to make practical sense to those responsible for it succeeding. It's a process that needs to come from those who are making the change. If it feels at all tacked on or peripheral to those responsible to, for doing it, then it's going to receive partial energy at best. Okay, so using the five principles highlighted, we should be able to develop a framework 
upon which to plan how we will address this problem of mobile, the mobile technology invasion in our classrooms. Not to insult anybody's intelligence, but this problem shouldn't be any different from any other problem facing educators in, in a daily basis. Rather than finding ourselves in the disadvantaged position of only reacting, we can treat this like any other problem, like a student not doing homework or disruptive talking in the classroom, and come up with a framework or strategy to use uh, to take advantage of this change. Step one is to figure out what assets we have. In this case, what kind of technology do your students carry with them when they walk into your room, and whether students what might might be what other solutions might also be available to you. What do you have access to or can get access to? So that's step one. Step two is figuring out how much time do you want to spend on this. Is this something that you that can be done in a single lesson, or is it something that needs to be built up upon? Thinking about time is a way of removing as much anxiety as possible when doing something new. How much time is it going to take to figure out your assets? How much time is it going to take to figure out what can be done with the available resources? How much time is needed to conduct pilot experiments? What do you want to begin trying out to use these resources? How much time is this whole project going to take? Carefully considering time is essential to keeping down the anxiety as much as possible. Step three is the one where we can easily tr lose track and fail. What is the end learning goal? Remember, the whole point of, of this is to add to our students' learning experience, not to highlight some technology. So we have to keep this one at the forefront. Why are we doing what we're doing? Yes, we are pressured by wanting to address a potential problem of technology invading our classrooms, but it's not enough just to address the invasion. This is why banning or ignoring the problem just doesn't work. How can we take advantage of the fact that so many of our students and colleagues are carrying around in their pockets more technology than NASA took with them to the moon in the 60s and 70s? But it is essential that our primary goal is learning, not technology. Okay, so in 2004, I was working with several Pepperdine classmates. We'd read Howard Rheingold's book, Smart Mobs, and we wanted to experiment with the possibility of doing something ridiculous, like trying to use cell phones as a part of a lesson. Now, in fairness to my friends, the eighth graders were able to, to write ha haikus about nature on their phones and text the results to the educator running the experiment. So we were uh, successful with the experiment. But as a day-to-day -day kind of thing that you're going to do in your classroom, it felt too much like a solution looking for a problem and not something particularly practical when you needed to do it with 30 or more students on a daily basis. I can only imagine what the students were, who were using telephones without texting plans, trying to explain, explain to their parents uh, that you know, this, this fee on the phone for the month was part of a school project. That's how tacked on it kind of felt. Okay, so here's a good example. One of the perks of my job at Full Sail University, uh, the EDMT program, is that we frequently get to work with some really great schools and really great educators who want to take, who want to make a difference serving their communities. So sitting at lunch one afternoon, I heard from a colleague about a local elementary school where the students sit on yoga balls and work on netbooks or are welcomed to bring e-readers and iPads from home to do their work. I had to check out the school and find out what was going on, and what I saw confirmed my suspicions about what such a school might look like. So when Assistant Principal Brian Dolphy took me around to Autobahn Park Elementary uh, in the comfortable community of Baldwin Park near Orlando, I didn't find a shining shrine to technology. In fact, the first thing that struck me as I observed one room where the teacher was doing a reading lesson, reading lesson with a group of students around a horseshoe table was that this looks like just any other good school where students were actively engaged in their learning. In another classroom, the teacher stood in the back of the room reviewing a science unit projected in the front of the room and students were actively offering their responses to her prompts. And yes, there were classrooms with students sitting at tables of four, contentedly bouncing on yoga balls while they worked on their netbooks. But the point here was the technology was so embedded in the classroom practice that it was virtually invisible. The K-5 school of 1,150 students had been at their current site for about five years and they were in the second year of this BYOD, Bring Your Own Device, Interactive Education Program. 
So I asked Dolphy, what was it that motivated their principal, Trevor Honan, Honahan, sorry, to make the investment in time and money to attempt this program they were developing? So Honan said that, the, the, said that some Promethean interactive boards had been installed, and the principal noted that the level of engagement improved in those classrooms. So he started to look for ways to get the boards uh, into more classrooms, and with the better level of engagement came greater parental support. And then with greater parental support and community support, turned into community fundraisers to add netbooks to the classroom, and eventually a writing lab with iPads was created. I had heard that they had chosen not to do local funding methods because it was because it got around the district expense, technology constraints, and the bureaucracy of working with the district. I asked what kind of technology support they were getting for all these computers, netbooks, and devices that brought from home, and Dolphy said that they had one part-time technician from the district who was mainly occupied with keeping the school site network running, and everything else was being handled by teachers, staff, and students. So they had more tech, and then repeat. Um, math, science, and social studies curriculum were being handled completely online so students could access materials via the school Wi-Fi or from home. Students who brought in technology were assisted getting online to work with the network. So I asked how students moved around the network, and Dolphy said that the online Wi-Fi was mostly for content delivery, with students saving their work on their own USB keys. Not every classroom was the same, but having been my fair share of school tours and this to me, was not a dog and pony show to fool the visitor from Full Sail. As I concluded in my article about the school that I wrote in my blog, here was a case where teachers were set up to succeed, learning how to use the technology in the context of their day-to-day -day job in a way that helped them reach and work with their students, which makes the students more engaged, which makes the parents happy, which makes the principal in the district happy. This isn't a school, this is not a story about technology, but about smart, dedicated people taking advantage of the tools within their reach, or making it so that the tools are within their reach, and then getting the job of learning and serving done with their students. No giant screens with intrusive booming messages, no hoverboards or student drones wearing white earphones, just teachers, students, administrators, and communities working together and taking advantage of the tech. You can find um, my article there uh, at uh, disruptiveedtech.com. So what does the community and the research say further about this uh, bring your own device kind of stuff? So I decided to jump back all the way back to 2005 in the winter and look for this on cue uh, publication when Palm PDAs ruled the world is what I kind of thought about this. I really love this issue because it brought back all these memories and it wasn't that long ago, but besides uh, the, the publication being rather small and in black and white, um, we have to put ourselves in the mindset of what was going on at this time. And you have to remember that at this time, uh, this was actually three years before iOS or the iPhone was introduced. And so it was a very different world in many ways. So one thing in this issue was uh, Kevin Silberger, uh, wrote, he was writing about Palm PDAs as portable tools for anecdotal observations with specific Palm applications created to tally observations. And so this is something I, in fact, had in my hand, kind of enabled me to do real-time observations in my students. Kind of it raised a level of accountability as a tool for me as an instructor. Then there was an article about the KIPP schools giving cell phones to the teachers so that they could have instant communication with their students and with their families. This was a disruptive technology. It was meant to bridge the gap between educators and students. So the KIPP schools felt like this was something that they needed to do, change the model, use this disruptive technology in a way that uh, hopefully would bring these, uh, these schools where they were serving uh, low SES communities kind of... Um, just bridging the gap and, and, not, and, and filling those gaps where students often fall in the cracks. Okay, there was also, also other articles, this one in particular that I have on the screen here, um, that really struck me from the sixth grade teacher, John Corippo, who took his $5,000 Fred prize to purchase 10 Palm PDAs with keyboards, a printer, and software. From this beginning, he and co-teacher Tracy Hurd was able to make and create a multi-year program 
And when his parents of his medium to low SES community saw the level of student engagement, 85% of them purchased PDAs for their own children in the first year. And by the end, by the second year, 90% had purchased PDAs. So student engagement leading to parental support, leading to an expansion of technology usage in the classroom. Where have we heard this before? At the end of the article, Crippo talks about his hope that California will get on board and support digital media instead of textbooks. He said, and I quote, Imagine a day when the district is buying kids a Palm PDA for like 130 bucks with all the texts on it. All their base reading is on it. They can change fonts. They can annotate, scroll through on the fly. Imagine kids being able to, anno to do annotations in the fourth and fifth grade. To that I say, dreamer. And then, of course, I have to worry or wonder, what are, the, what's, what are they going to say about us in 2017 when they look at what we've proposed? Okay, so then I went out and I looked for some friends to, on, in the Twitter, in the Facebook, in the Google Plus world, and asked them about what they, how they felt about um, this mobile tech invasion. And I, got, I was happy to get this response from a fellow Pepperdine alum, Nancy Smith, telling me that she just completed a study for her doctoral dissertation during which 25 fellow doctoral students were given iPod touches, and after one hour of training and computer lab setup, were told to use the devices in their qualitative methods course and were encouraged to use them for their personal use. So one element that I found interesting in Smith's study was that it was set up to be an inductive study going from observation, looking for patterns towards tentative hypothesis leading to theory. It wasn't a study to justify the use of technology. She wanted to see the patterns of adoption and integration who would be immediately comfortable with the new technology and who would be resistant? In the process, she created this chart representing the movement of the, uses, the users towards what she called the enthusiasm zone, the negative zone, and the tension zone. So then upon distribution, the four, there were four participants who immediately moved from moved to the enthusiasm zone. Three moved to the negative zone and the remaining 18 landed in the tension zone. Once they became more comfortable, 11 participants quickly moved from the tension zone to the enthusiasm zone. Then after interacting with their peers, three more moved from the tension zone to the enthusiasm zone. During the time, four moved around the tension zone but eventually ended up in the negative zone. The three who moved immediately to the negative zone never left. At the end of the study, there were 18 in the enthusiasm zone and seven in the negative zone. Uh, the chart's a little math, you know. Um, but Smith felt like, given more time, the four who had moved from the tension zone to the negative zone might have moved back to the enthusiasm zone. Smith felt like it was important to recognize that these learners come to their new experiences with their own previous experiences and attitudes about technology, mobile technology, and Apple. Smith told her own subjective story and talked about how she as a child observed her father, grandfather, and uncles working on artistic objects, repairing radios, cars, household items in their workspaces. And then she had a great uncle, or yeah, a great uncle who owned an electronics store that sold everything from TVs to washing machines to Christmas lights, and how she was enamored with this one thing, the tiny resistor, the transistor radios. Okay? So revealing a little bit about her age. Um, she said she wanted some, so, one so badly that she dreamed about it. And I quote when she's telling the story. So one Monday after lunch, my father and I went to, went to window shopping. We stopped at the electronics shop's window. And as I gazed at my beloved transistor radios, I told my dad, those, those will have TVs. He agreed. That evening, I tried my discovery out on my mom. One day, transistor radios will have TVs in them, I said. Nancy, her mom said, you know that it's wrong to lie. So for her, technology became meaning, technology became linked to dreams, position, power, and the acquisition of knowledge. Little wonder that technology and these little devices would play a powerful role in Smith's life as an educator. So what was her conclusion at the end of the study? And I quote, 
This study revealed that the majority of adult learners enjoy mobile technology for learning if they're given the opportunity to integrate it into their own educational and professional practice in a manner relevant to each individual. However, not all adult learners are alike, and with other uh, new experiences, some iPod Touch participants are overwhelmingly enthusiastic, some experience skepticism that turns to enthusiasm, and others turn uh, and others, though negative, may in the future find positive impact in their exposure. So, the perception on whether the change is organic, simple, and value-add versus tacked on or just another thing can also be a deciding factor. Then this past Friday, the latest issue from Le Learning and Leading, uh, Volume 39, Number 5, for those keeping store, showed up at my doorstep, and I was delightfully presented with the challenge of having part of my topic, BYOD, brought to the fore. So I'd like to take a moment to address uh, Dr. Stagger's objections to BYOD. Uh, Dr. St uh, Stagger was my professor uh, when I was getting my master's degree at Pepperdine. And he's pretty well known for having strong opinions about what's wrong with how education has been managed these past several decades. Dr. S Dr. Stagger knows well from what he preaches, having been associated uh, with the legendary Seymour Papert. You may well know this, and so I apologize if I'm preaching to the choir, but in the early days when the micro computers were entering the classroom, MIT and Papert studied the potential and in those early days determined that technology, due to its, ex its expense in time, support, and money, needed to deliver more than what was being promoted. And what was being promoted, of course, is, as we all know, is the standalone drill and kill stations. What they figured out was that if they taught students how to program, computer programming, then they would be teaching them, their students, three fundamental skills. Communication, problem solving and creative thinking. In those early days, the vision was to use computers to add to the educational experience in ways that weren't easily doable without computers. Alas, the technology market has tended to dumb down its potential in the classroom in search for faster, cheaper, smaller devices, forgetting the, the, the vision of Papert. So let's address uh, Stagger's objections. Okay, the first one. Um, let's see, uh, BYOD enshrines inequity, and Steiger writes, All, it only, the only way to guarantee equitable educational experience requires same access for all students. This, for me, is policy versus practice. We want every student to have the same access. If by BYOD were the only option, then yes, we're dealing with separate but equal foolishness. There's a difference of allowing for and supporting versus BYOD as the only option. BYOD creates false equivalencies between any object that happens to use electricity. And then he more forcefully says, cell phones are not computers. To this I say I totally agree. I think that we've learned that there is a base level where the technology is not value add, like having only one computer one student computer in the classroom. BYOD needs something more powerful than a feature phone. We should not make important educational decisions based on price. Again, I totally agree. Steiger has had to contend with small-minded bureaucrats, so I understand his concern. BYOD should never fall victim to the, we don't need to fund this because we're taking care of it with BYOD, a la the California lottery kind of fiasco. BYOD is an option, not an excuse, to not fund the educational system. BYOD narrows the learning process to information access and chat. And then he says, say no to looking up answers in PowerPoint. Again, I have to agree. We have to beware of the tacked on drill and kill, lowest common denominator, solution looking for a problem kind of tech. What we're really wanting to do here is we want to keep the focus on student learning. BYOD increases student ang or teacher anxiety. And he says, schools have failed to encourage computer usage after three decades. Yes. And so on some level, we are talk we're taking matters into our own hands and finding working solutions like BYOD. Because sometimes waiting for administrations to do something is really a non-starter and just an excuse to perpetuate this technology gap that we've been dealing with for th three decades. 
Things change because small groups of enthusiasts find a way. Waiting for the bureaucracy, no, not such a good thing. Uh, BYOD diminishes the otherwise enormous potential of educational computing to the weakest device in the room. And he says, a real computers provides an intellectual library and vehicle for self-expression limited by the least powerful de- device. Again, see the telephones that aren't, see the comment about telephones aren't computers. There is really a base level that doesn't work. It helps to remember that most smartphones have the capacities beyond the computers that took, us, took the astronauts to the moon in the 60s and 70s. And do not underestimate what students and teachers can do with these devices. Just because they're not giant PCs, cutting edge, doesn't mean that we cannot harness them. We want to use BYOD as an option, not as a, as a, as a limitation. BYOD contributes to the growing narr- uh, narrative that education is not worth the investment. And then he says, democracy and high quality education systems require adequate educational funding. And he makes a note that, you know, often in these uh, school sites, you can see the tech coordinator with the latest cell phone and uh, latest hardware hanging from his belt and then, you know, kind of referring back to his students in terms of, well, let them eat cell phones. I totally agree. This is back to the policy versus practice deal. We do this because we are actively bridging the gap between our students' experiences in the classroom and their world the rest of the time. Properly done, BYOD brings to the fore all of the good educational practices of ownership, creativity, and learning to and learning that gets lost when education is limited to a one-size-fits-all bureaucratic solution. BYOD is an option. The things that stagger fears is not technology-related, but the decision-making predilections towards outdated educational policies made by decision-makers that are just looking at this as an option to cut the budget. So you can take advantage of this invasion with careful planning and keeping the end goals in mind, staying aware of the five principles that I've laid out. One final thought. The force for change and the expense of technology pushes us to reveal what we really believe education should look like. Like my discovery when I visited the netbook using Yoga Ball School in Baldwin Park, this isn't really about technology at all, but about the future of education. Thank you.